So now we are going to start with endocrine physiology. Okay. So first a small introduction about the endocrine system. So in endocrine system, it is the study where the chemicals is going to do the function. So endocrine system is the study of systems where the chemical messengers is going to enter into the specific target cell. The messengers will be secreted in their respective glands and they enter into the blood circulation And through the blood circulation, it is going to reach the target cells to perform its function. Okay, so this, this is the small introduction about the endocrine system. So we are going to see what are all the endocrine glands which is present in our body. And what are the hormones those glands is going to be synthesized. And what is the function of those hormones? And what are all the variations or the clinical diagnosis we are going to see due to the increase or decrease of those hormones? Okay, so that is what we are going to see in this endocrine physiology. And before going into the specific glands and its functions, hormones, all those things, what is the head ganglion? or higher control center for endocrine system that is hypothalamus this is the seat controlling center for the endocrine system this is considered to be the head ganglion of endocrine system. So from the hypothalamus you are going to get signals to synthesize and release the hormones in their respective glands. Okay, clear? And we will also see the feedback mechanisms which is involved in regulating the endocrine hormones. Okay, so those feedback mechanisms will give their signals whether it is increased or decreased or whatever it is, those signals will reach the hypothalamus and this hypothalamus will be the one which is controlling the variations in the values. Okay, clear? So what are all the endocrine glands we have? Just listed from the top part of our body. The first one is pituitary gland and pituitary gland you have anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary okay they have their respective hormone secretions and it will perform their specific functions and next to the pituitary gland you have thyroid gland and next what is the hormone you have adrenal gland which is also called as suprarenal gland why it is situated superior to the kidney and the next one is ovary in female Testers in male. Okay. So these are the and an, another one we have pancreas. 
okay clear so pancreas is considered to be the both exocrine and endocrine gland okay in git also we have seen pancreas in endocrine system also we are seeing the pancreas so this shows that it is having both exocrine and endocrine function the term endocrine means it is a gland which is been synthesizing the hormone and that is going to enter into the blood circulation and through the blood circulation it will reach the specific target tissues in exocrine system it is the one where you will consider only the pancreatic juice in endocrine system you will consider the hormone which is synthesized in the pancreas released into the blood circulation and go and reach the target cells so that is why pancreas is the structure which is considered to be both exocrine and endocrine in its function so now we will see in detail about each and every gland the hormones everything so first and foremost what we are going to see is the pituitary gland so when you talk about the pituitary gland it is also called as hypophysis cerebri okay so where is the pituitary gland located cella tersica have you heard about the term cella tersica it is a part which is present in the where it is present in the base of the skull you have the region called as cella tersica that is the place where the pituitary gland is sitting okay so this is the pituitary gland and this pituitary gland you have two pituitary glands that is anterior pituitary gland and posterior pituitary gland and this is the pituitary stalk okay from the pituitary stalk you will get anterior pituitary gland and posterior pituitary gland this anterior pituitary gland is also called as adeno hypophysis posterior pituitary is also called as neuro hypophysis okay clear and both anterior and posterior pituitary gland is now going to produce the hormones and one another important factor is this anterior pituitary gland contains the cells which synthesizes its own hormone but in case of posterior pituitary the hormones are synthesized in the hypothalamus and through the neural circuit neural path it is stored in the posterior pituitary gland and this posterior pituitary gland will only release those hormones when stimulated clear so this is one of the important point you have to remember anterior pituitary gland synthesizes the hormones and releases when there is a stimulus in case of posterior pituitary gland it will not synthesize the hormone the hormones of posterior pituitary is synthesized in the hypothalamus and then it is stored in the posterior pituitary and it will release the hormones when it is needed during the presence of stimulus and there are two specific nucleus in the hypothalamus one is supra optic nucleus paraventricular nucleus this two nucleus is the one 
in the hypothalamus which is synthesizing the posterior pituitary hormones okay clear clear with the structure of pituitary gland yes okay now we will move on to the hormones of the posterior and anterior pituitary gland so in the anterior lobe of pituitary gland we have growth hormone okay it is also called as somatotropic hormone and second one which is called as prolactin it is lactotrophic hormone third one is thyroid stimulating hormone that is thyrotrophic hormone and adrenocorticotrophic hormone that is corticotrophic hormone and gonadotrophic hormone which you call it as gonadotrophins okay so so these are all the major hormones which is produced in the anterior pituitary gland and in this we will see some subdivisions in the what are all the hormones going to do okay so these are the hormones of the anterior pituitary gland in detail we are going to see about all these hormones so first one what we are going to see is the growth hormone as the name growth hormone what will be the major function of it it is going to involve its function in growth of all the cells it will be having its role in the growth of all the cells okay so that is mainly through the insulin growth factor 1 that is somatomedin c and it is having its role in all the metabolic process of proteins carbohydrates minerals everything okay and among the carbohydrate mechanism this growth hormone is having a significant effect that is what you call as anti insulin effect so what is meant by this anti insulin effect what is the role of insulin general it is a what is the function of insulin it what is the function of insulin with respect to glucose level blood glucose level decreases so that is the function of insulin but this growth hormone is having anti insulin effect in the sense what it is going to do with the respect of blood glucose it increases the blood glucose in our body we are having so many endocrine glands and they are producing so many hormones except insulin all the hormones is having the effect of increasing the blood glucose insulin is the only hormone which is present in our body which decreases the blood glucose okay so a person may have any kind of endocrine abnormality other than insulin if there is 
excess of any of the hormonal effect the person will have increase of blood glucose level so the increased blood glucose level what you call it as diabetes mellitus okay so that is one of the important function of growth hormone and the other actions of growth hormone which to be considered and remembered always is the role in erythropoiesis and it is having a major role in the growth of mammary glands which is mainly required for milk production okay clear so this is the most important functions of the growth hormone and the next one what we are going to see is what will happen if there is hyposecretion of growth hormone hyposecretion of growth hormone what you term the condition called as hyposecretion of growth hormone dwarfism and you have to specify it is pituitary dwarfism because there is also going to be another type of dwarfism it is not due to the growth hormone it is due to the thyroid hormone so you have to specify if you are mentioning dwarfism it is pituitary dwarfism in case of pituitary dwarfism dwarf means short okay and this growth hormone is having its role in growth of all the cells including the cells of the bone what do you call them osteocytes okay so in general the dwarfism is most commonly seen in children so in children what about the growth of the bones you have the epiphysis diaphysis and you will see the epiphyseal plates okay so this growth hormone will help in the fusion of epiphysis with the diaphysis okay until the fusion there will be a effect of growth hormone over the bones and this increases the length of the bones if there is deficiency of growth hormone the increase in the length will be restricted and with that restricted growth of the bones it will fuse epiphysis with the diaphysis so because of this feature the person will not have a normal height of their own structure so they will appear short okay so that condition you term it as dwarfism but in this case of dwarfism the person will have normal intelligence and iq the person will have normal alertness the defect is only in the skeletal growth not with the neural growth so the person will have normal intelligence normal iq normal alertness everything will be normal with respect to the cognition okay clear but one more defect which you can find in this case is they do not undergo puberty why because this growth hormone is having the major role in the gonadotrophic hormonal function in the production of ovary in the formation of ovary testes in the synthesis of estrogen progesterone so all over the hormones of the reproductive system this growth hormone is required as one of the most important factor so since growth hormone is deficient they do not undergo puberty okay so that is the concept regarding the dwarfism 
and next we will see the hyper secretion of growth hormone this hyper secretion of growth hormone you will find it in two different age groups in children and in adults in children the same phenomenon of epiphysis fusing with the diaphysis so the growth hormone role is to increase the length of the bones before the fusion of epiphysis with the diaphysis instead of this normal increase in the length in case of hyper secretion there will be excessive increase in the length of the bones and then later on it will go and fuse with the epiphysis fuses with the diaphysis so it resulting in a condition called as jay jandism so all the long bones will be very very long okay instead of normal height the person will have enormous increase in the length of all the bones and they will appear very high and this is also resulting in the apart from the appearance they will have very weak jaw and diabetes mellitus will be highly positive in this case because of the excess of growth hormone okay clear because other than insulin all the hormones will have anti insulin effect since the growth hormone is high the person will encounter diabetes mellitus okay clear and in case of adults if you are encountering excess of growth hormone after the fusion of epiphysis with the diaphysis in the sense the skeletal growth is normal after the fusion because of any other reason the person is encountering hyper secretion of growth hormone then what will happen the epiphysis fused with the diaphysis already later on the person is encountering increase of growth hormone this leads to increase in the thickness of the bones instead of increase in the length which is happening in jejantism here the person have increase in the thickness of the bones it has fused with the diaphysis already it cannot grow any more in the length wise but it will grow in its thickness so that is called as acromegaly okay remember so hyposecretion is dwarfism most commonly encountered in children hypersecretion is excess of growth hormone if you are encountering in children before the fusion of epiphysis with the diaphysis you will term it as jejantism and if you are encountering after the fusion of epiphysis and the diaphysis you term it as acromegaly so this acromegalic person will have long feet and increased thickness thick thick fingers and they have protruded jaw you call them as prognathism okay so these are the peculiar features you will find in the person who is acromegalic okay and along with this they will also have increase of blood glucose level okay clear so this is what is about the features of growth hormone and some important features in the acromegaly is apart from the appearance the main thing is prognathism it is like the person will have protruded jaw like this this is called as prognathism so when you are finding the person you have this protruded jaw so that is what you call them as prognathism and you will also find conditions like 
kyphosis that is abnormal curvature in the vertebral bones and you also see hirsutism what is meant by hirsutism abnormal. abnormal excessive growth of hair in the body parts and the person will have gynecomastia what is gynecomastia abnormal, abnormal et in the breast development and they will also have lactation because this growth hormone is required as a normal factor in the development and growth of mammary glands since the growth hormone is in excess it will stimulate the mammary glands and it will enlarge the size of the breast and at last diabetes mellitus because of anti insulin effect okay done completed we will change so this is what is about the growth hormone clear and we will move on to the next hormone yes then shall i move okay the next hormone called as prolactin so prolactin is the important hormone which is having a major role in the mammary glands of breast so what is the functions this is for the development of mammary glands of the breast especially during pregnancy during pregnancy it will increase the growth of the mammary glands and it will increase the milk production it will secrete the milk okay during pregnancy plus lactation after delivery okay and then second thing this initiates the milk production remember prolactin is the hormone which is involved only in initiating the milk production and it will initiate the milk production whatever milk has been produced it is stored in the mammary glands okay but it will not help in milk ejection process okay clear this is the important confused question always given milk ejection is by oxytocin it is one of the posterior lobe uh, hormone of the pituitary gland milk production is by prolactin there are two factors milk production is different milk ejection is different clear okay and if there is prolactin press if the prolactin is present normally this prolactin will inhibit the gonadotropic hormone they are fsh and lh which is normally required for menstruation okay so prolactin generally it inhibits the gonadotropic hormone gonadotropic hormones are fsh and lh this fsh and lh is having the normal role during menstruation but in case of the person is in the process of lactation because of excess of prolactin there will be absence of fsh and lh and the person will experience amenorrhea after the delivery until the milk production is there until the presence of prolactin is there this use is specifically called as lactational amenorrhea okay if it is not due to prolactin in generally there is deficiency of fsh lh and the absence of menstruation 
you term it as amenorrhea and then later you rule out the cause of amenorrhea but if the person is having the process of breast feeding the person the woman is in the period of breast feeding and she is experiencing amenorrhea that is normal it is because of the excess of prolactin which is inhibiting the gonadotropic hormone due to that the sh she is experiencing amenorrhea that is lactational amenorrhea but this will not happen in all the breastfeeding women some cases she will experience normal menstruation during the breastfeeding also there are some physiological mechanisms which will happen without any known cause clear okay so that is called as lactational amenorrhea and because of this prolactin once when the woman is delivering the baby immediately a bond develops between the newborn and the mother so that maternal behavior is created because of this prolactin okay clear so that maternal behavior emotional behavior a bond develops between the newborn and the mother how this is happening it is because of excessive production of prolactin after the parturition process so that is the significant function of prolactin and what are all the factors which is involved in regulation of prolactin secretion we have to consider those factors why this prolactin is increased especially after the delivery after the parturition why this is increased during breastfeeding so the first and foremost important factor is suction reflex once when the baby sucks the nipple of the mother this suction will cause stretching of the myometrium of the breast glands and that suction reflex will give signal to the higher control center what is the higher control center in respect to endocrine hypothalamus it will immediately give signal to the anterior pituitary lobe to release prolactin this prolactin will come and act on the mammary glands and it increases the production of milk okay clear so that suction reflex and you will also experience this when you manipulate the breast manipulation of breast during sexual act the prolactin production uh, inducing the milk production will also be increased and second one is <clears throat> there is a factor which decreases the secretion so what is that factor which decreases the secretion is due to prolactin inhibitory hormone so as like hormone which is involved in excessive prolactin production prh prolactin releasing hormone and there is also a hormone from the hypothalamus which inhibits the prolactin production okay clear so this is what is with the prolactin now we will move on to the third hormone of the anterior pituitary lobe that is acth what is acth adreno corticotrophic hormone okay so from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland to the adrenal lobe okay clear so this is how the signal is going to reach so hypothalamus will release the hormone called as corticotrophin releasing hormone so this corticotrophin releasing hormone will go and act on the 
anterior pituitary anterior lobe of the pituitary gland and this anterior lobe of pituitary once when gets the signal from crh it releases acth adrenocorticotrophic hormone this will go and act on the adrenal gland and it results in the synthesis of the hormones okay clear yeah, so this is how the acth is going to work and this will also have a negative feedback mechanism for example if acth is in excess this excess of acth itself will go and give signal to the hypothalamus that will inhibit the release of crh then the acth will become normal if the acth acting on the adrenal gland and you are encountering the corticosteroids cortisol catecholamines everything is in excess that itself will go and give signal to the pituitary gland and it will go and signal to the hypothalamus to inhibit the release of crh that will inhibit acth and the hormones in the peripheral circulation will become normal or if it is encountering decrease of the adrenal hormones then it will give positive feedback stimulus to release more and more of crh that will release more and more of acth and resulting in the increase of the peripheral hormones from the adrenal gland so the feedback mechanism here will happen in vice versa and this is a example of negative feedback mechanism okay clear so this is what is called as acth and next we will see thyroid stimulating hormone so so far we are seeing the hormones of anterior lobe of the pituitary gland okay thyroid stimulating hormone this thyroid stimulating hormone and and remember here this one which is giving you this axis you call it as hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis in short you call as hpa axis okay and now what you are going to see with respect to tsh is hypothalamo pituitary thyroid axis and here what is going to happen from the hypothalamus to the pituitary anterior lobe of the pituitary to the thyroid gland it results in the production of t3 t4 calcitonin so far okay and this is also having the same pattern of feedback mechanism from the hypothalamus it releases thyrotrophin releasing hormone this thyrotrophin releasing hormone will act on the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland resulting in the release of thyroid stimulating hormone this thyroid stimulating hormone will act on the thyroid gland and inducing the release of t3 and t4 and if this is being getting increased then it will give negative feedback signal to the pituitary gland as well as to the hypothalamus which will inhibit the release of trs tsh respectively and make the hormones in the periphery to become normal in the same way it is also giving the negative feedback mechan positive feedback mechanism if the hormone level is less it will give positive feedback mechanism to both pituitary and the hypothalamus and enhancing the secretion and it will become normal so this is hpa axis this is hpt axis like this we have all the axis in our endocrine system and the last of the hormones among the anterior pituitary gland is
gonadotrophic hormones they are called as gnrh the gonadotrophic hormones includes fsh and lh so these two hormones have its major role in both male and the female reproductive function in later on after completing the endocrine uh, hormones we will also see the reproductive hormones there i will explain you in detail about the functions of fsh and lh okay and as as like the other axis here also we have the axis that you call in case of male you call as hypothalamo pituitary testicular axis here in female you call as hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis where the action is going to take place in the ovary and here the action is going to take place in the testes okay clear and now we will move on to the posterior pituitary hormones okay so posterior pituitary gland it is also called as neurohypophysis it is not involved in the synthesis of any hormone the hormones of posterior pituitary gland is synthesized from the hypothalamus and only released by the posterior pituitary gland remember this this is very 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 important you will get mcqs in relation to this for the hormones of the posterior pituitary gland you have only two hormones one is adh anti diuretic hormone and oxytocin you will get the questions oxytocin is produced from hypothalamus pituitary which is the answer oxytocin is released from pituitary posterior pituitary gland produced is different released is different so this confusing question you will always encounter between the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland okay so first we will see the anti diuretic hormone the posterior pituitary hormones are only two adh and oxytocin and these two hormones have two significant functions adh is having two significant function oxytocin is also having two significant function so the first function of adh is in the process of blood pressure regulation okay so we have seen yesterday renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism in that mechanism angiotensin 2 is considered to be the potent vasoconstrictor this in turn also gives signal to the aldosterone which helps in the sodium retention along with that it is also retaining the water and increasing the in normalizing the blood pressure and along with this when there is increase of angiotensin 2 okay what it will do is it will also give signal to the posterior pituitary gland to release more and more of adh why because this adh is having a special role in the collecting tubule of the nephron in the collecting tubule of the nephron that is the place where maximum of water reabsorption takes place during urine formation okay here the water reabsorption takes place through the channels they are called as aqua porins okay so this is in the collecting tubule of the nephron the reabsorption of water takes place through aqua porins these aqua porins will not remain open always they will open they will get activated in the presence of 
ADH. So this ADH will come and activate the aquaporins resulting in the opening of the aquaporins in the collecting tubules of the nephron leads to reabsorption of water. So what happens finally? Blood volume is increased resulting in the regulation of blood pressure. Okay. So this is the two important function of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Okay. So if in case there is excess of ADH, what will happen? What is the function of ADH? Reabsorption of water. Okay. So if it is in excess, water reabsorbed is also excess. Increases the blood volume. Increases the blood pressure. In order to auto-regulate the fluid level in the body, the kidney will do its function in excess of urination. Frequency of urination increased. This frequency of urination is increased also in diabetes mellitus. But here in case, in this case, you call it as diabetes insipidus. The polyuria is not due to increase of blood glucose level. It is due to increase of water level in the body, which is due to the excess of ADH. Okay, clear? So that is one of the variation you will face with respect to ADH. And now we will see the function of oxytocin. One of the function of oxytocin is during parturition process. What is the role of it in parturition? Contraction of uterine myometrium and stretching of cervix of the uterus favors the delivery of fetus from the womb. Okay. And another important function of oxytocin is Milk ejection reflex. After the parturition, once when the baby sucks the nipple of the mother, it will stimulate the signal and it will release the oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. Remember, it is releasing the oxytocin, not producing. Okay. So oxytocin, whatever is being produced and stored in the posterior pituitary gland is released. And also during the suction process, the signal will go to the anterior lobe of the pituitary to produce prolactin. So these are the two hormones and its two significant functions of posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So up to this, the posterior pituitary gland is over.